My name is Jacqueline Leeds. I'm the Director of Communications at Animal Defense Partnership. Um, we provide free legal counsel to now over 180 nonprofits that advocate for animals and or plant-based diet change, including PERCA, the Pennsylvania Rhino Conservation Advocates, founded in 2016. PARCA has a mission to fund the relocation and protection of wild rhinos, fund the care of young rhinos orphaned by poaching, and raise public awareness about their plight. Today, we are getting to talk with Heather Smith, the founder, past president, and board member of PARCA. Um, and before introducing Heather more fully, I want to invite you, whether you are watching on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, to ask questions via the comments um, so that I can share those with Heather as well. So Heather is a registered nurse and has earned her Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a Master of Jurisprudence in Health Law. In addition to founding and guiding the work of PARCA, Heather currently serves as Chief Operating Officer of the Department of Neurosurgery at Penn Medicine. So Heather, can you start off by telling us a little bit about how this all got started with your trip to Namibia and um, your partnership with the Botswanian conservationists? Sure, thanks Jacqueline, happy to be here. Um, so, yeah, in 2015, uh, I went to a work laser that I had attended for a couple of years. And that year, um, on a whim, I raised my hand during a live auction for a safari because it had been my dream trip and um, something struck me. And I won. And we went to Namibia. And when I, it was, exactly what I thought Africa would be. It was, I just loved everything about it. And when I came home, I thought, gosh, you know, I'd really like to preserve what I had seen there, help do something. I didn't even know what. Later that same year, a physician colleague at work had arranged for a couple named uh, Derek and Beverly Joubert, who are conservationists in Botswana, living in Botswana, uh, to come to Penn Medicine and do a lecture on leadership from a conservation perspective. And after that lecture, I got to chat with them, told them about Namibia and that I'd like to get involved. And they suggested that one specific way I could do that was to help them with a new project they had just started uh, in partnership with another company called and Beyond. The joint partnership was called Rhinos Without Borders. And that uh, purpose of that um, organization and project was to move rhinos from South Africa to Botswana to number one, repopulate them in Botswana. They had been virtually eliminated there uh, through hunting and poaching and to relieve some pressure in South Africa uh, where poaching was in, on the increase again. And so a small group of us got together and said, happy to help with the rhinos. And from there, things just took off and we decided to become more formal as a nonprofit. Um, so can you share more about rhinos in particular? I've read that they're an umbrella species. Yeah. Um, can you explain more about what that means and why the rhinos are extra important to preserve? Sure. So an umbrella species generally means if you protect it, it acts as an umbrella so that there are other things within its ecosystem you protect. So rhinos are one of those animals. So when we protect the rhinos ecosystem, we protect all the other animals that live there with them. So rhinos are herbivores, right? They graze on grass and eat branches and bush, um, depending on white or black rhinos. Um, as they move along and create paths, other antelopes, for example, or other animals that come along behind and graze a little bit differently have more ground available for them to graze on. Of course, they're dispersing seed as they process their food as well. So that's one way as an herbivore that known as a mega herbivore that they create space and um, opportunity for other grazers. And again, this umbrella concept of when we protect them, we protect everything that also exists within that ecosystem. That's, I didn't know that about mega herbivores. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've read, I heard in a video, you talked about poaching on the increase in South Africa, that mm -hmm. one rhino is killed every seven and a half hours. Yeah, so it is, so South Africa definitely feels the most pressure. Uh, with poaching, they have the highest concentration of rhinos. So that is one reason, of course, the more there are, the more opportunity there is for poaching. Um, 
And they're in this, what they call the latest wave. So after the, over the last um, 10 or 15 years, the poaching was on the increase, really peaked in about 2014, 2015, um, and has been on the decrease since then. However, uh, the, the population, you know, they don't, they don't reproduce very quickly. So one being lost is significant. Um, oftentimes pregnant moms are poached, so we lose two, um, or the orf the, and a rhino is left orphaned. So sometimes, and hopefully folks that we work with can get to them and save them, but sometimes it does happen to be, it, you know, it ends up being two instead of one. Um, this year, uh, the poaching in South Africa seems to be moving a little bit south in the country, um, whether that's, and it's kind of out of the Kruger National Park, which is um, on the east coast, on the northeast coast, and it's there's exerted pressure coming down a little bit further uh, on the coast. Um, and if the rate continues at this pace, they're going to lose more than 500 rhinos in this one province that's now feeling um, this pressure. We were there just a couple of weeks ago. We got back two weeks ago and we stayed overnight in a very uh, famous park there. It's called Shoshui and Pelosi Park. And back in the 60s, when there was a spate of poaching, it's where um, Operation Rhino was, um, was born um, to save the population then, very successful. So uh, very famous park. Um, but it is feeling the pressure in particular right now. We camped there for a night while we visited, and we learned the next morning when we delivered some equipment to rangers that, in fact, while we slept the night before, a rhino was poached in the park. Really hit home for us. But that particular area is feeling an incredible pressure right now. Oh, that's, that's heartbreaking. I actually, I had the opportunity when I was in undergrad to study abroad in South Africa, and I, I was technically studying ethnomusicology, but mostly I chose South Africa because the, like you, I've always dreamed of going on safari. Um, and I think one of my favorite life memories is leaving in an open air safari vehicle, um, you know, probably at 4.30 in the morning, and just coming over the hill and seeing these elephants, but this line of elephants that were trunk to tail, and there were, I mean, there were probably a hundred elephants and it was just- Oh my gosh. I, it was breathtaking to see them in in their home and in the wild. Um, Cause yeah. I had only ever seen elephants in captivity, which were never, they were sad, not breathtaking. Um, yes. And I got to see rhinos as well and they were just as majestic. So. It really is breathtaking. I mean, when you think about um, any of those animals that, you know, whether you watch nature shows or you read books or you know, whatever it was, and that's what had always made it so appealing to me. And I just, as, and as appealing as it was, I had just never taken the plunge and gone there. Um, but it is that breathtaking is exactly the right word to see them in their native environment, which is also one of the reasons, you know, when people ask us why rhinos, because they belong there. And when you pull, you know, when you pull over the hill or you pull around the bend and they, and there they are, um, it really is, it is a sight to behold. Yeah. Um, what, so in Botswana, um, since I think, my, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that the reason that there were rhinos essentially extinct from Botswana um, is because they had been poached there first. Mm -hmm. but, so are there protections in place now that are different from before to help protect the rhinos or is it just the shift in population they'll be less targeted now? Well, so it's interesting. Um, to, and I would answer that with two, uh, two prongs. One is the governments, right? The governments in all of the countries are so critically important because if they make it a priority, um, that, you know, makes a very big difference. Um, so governmental help is critical. Um, and then the second way I would answer that is that um, one of the reasons that uh, the area in Botswana to which the Joubert's and Ambion moved these rhinos, one of the reasons they chose this particular area near the Akavango Delta is um, geographically, there are floodwaters that come and go. And so it helps with a geographic boundary, right? That makes it a little bit more difficult to access 
um, for a poacher to access. And it also can help um, contain the rhinos, right? So they can stay within a natural boundary that they won't cross. So there is some level of being able to monitor and protect them because of that as well. God, that makes sense. Um, what For people who don't know, what's one of the um, leading reasons why, well, aside from the money that is involved in poaching and on the black market, what do people purchasing these things think that they are purchasing um, rhino horns for? I mean, so why are these animals being poached for money? Yeah, so the horn is one of the most valuable illegally traded wildlife commodities. Um, and it is used in a couple different ways. So the horn for uh, traditional medicine purposes is believed um, to have curative property, which it does not. It is fingernails to be crystal clear. It is the same as your nails. Um, but you will see uh, there are documentaries about um, the medicinal purposes that will show people um, who shave, they take chunks of horn. So it's bought, it's, it can be bought as a whole horn, but it's often broken into chunks because it's easier to transport that way. Um, the chunks can be um, shaved and people will chew on the shavings. It can be ground into powders and used in, a, you know, dissolved in a liquid. Um, the, the horn itself can be kept intact it, because of the value that it has. It is also given as a gift. Um, and it is carved. So much like elephant ivory has been carved over time into trinkets and jewelry, uh, rhino horn has the same thing. It is admittedly when it is polished and finalized, it is beautiful. It has an attractive look to it. Um, but yeah, it is also used for jewelry and trinkets. And um, there has also been some historic um, handing down of a rhino horn made into a dagger in some cultures. That is a very important, um, you know, uh, transition to manhood uh, that has also happened with the horn. Gotcha. I'm curious, your background, really extensive background in the healthcare profession, has that shaped when you advocate for rhinos and anti-poaching? Has that shaped how you talk about sort of the senselessness of poaching? It has. So it's uh, it's a conversation that we've had a number of times, you know, around when we talk about our, you know, we have these efforts that are kind of reactive, right? How do we take care of orphans after their mom has been poached or, you know, things like that. As we talk about how can how might we be a little more proactive and do we have do we have any opportunity as a group of healthcare professionals to you know, publish scientific articles or, or write or somehow share that information and, and really advocate in that way. The studies are out there. There is, there is no medicinal value. So we haven't chosen to, to try to make that more, um, you know, officially, uh, you know, do that and say that in a more official way. Um, but we do try to repeat it and make sure that people understand so that when they hear it, it is crystal clear that that is in fact not, not at all any purpose that the horn can serve. The other thing I'll add, Jacqueline, just real quick is, you know, I find, you know, we talk in America all the time about how expensive healthcare is, right? Yeah. And I find it so, I, I get so angry to think about these folks who have a real condition, right? Especially because there was a there was a politician in Vietnam some years ago who claimed that rhino horn cured his cancer. And you can imagine what that did to demand, right? So in particular, you know, people with a fever, people with a hangover, people with some other things. But when I think about a cancer patient who has heard this and is so desperate to be cured and is now spending money and time and wasting both of those resources in, you know, putting it into something like rhino horn instead of spending their money and their time and, you know, really getting something that could help treat them. It's just, it makes me really angry um, that people with an illness like that can be so taken advantage of. I, it's true. The human toll of poaching. Is, yeah. Well, that, and then of course the human toll on the, the ground there, but. Yeah. I know that's a really good point. That's sad. What, um, tell me, tell us more about the process and the cost around moving a single rhino. 
Sure. So um, in the case of moving them from South Africa to Botswana, it's uh, rather dramatic because it's um, so far. So these uh, rhinos were identified in South Africa. The governments had to come to agreement to move the animals. And once that happened, they were um, sedated and loaded into crates. The crates were flown by cargo planes. So they had themselves an airplane ride. And then uh, once they landed in Botswana, uh, they were shipped out by truck um, across these um, plains as far as they could go. And again, because it's a floodplain, they would often run into water levels that the trucks could no longer get beyond. And in those cases, it became very dramatic because they would hellasling the rhinos. So they wrap um, bands around their uh, legs and they sling them upside down at the end of a huge chain by helicopter. Um, and they airlift them into the last uh, portion of that deep wilderness uh, translocation that they do. Now, um, there are certainly other opportunities to move them a little less dramatically. Uh, right now, uh, there is a project happening in Zimbabwe to move animals that, were, that doesn't include rhinos right now. But in that case, it will be because it's a shorter distance in one country, those animals, including rhinos, hopefully ultimately, um, but they will all go by truck. Um, but it's still, a, you know, an enormous undertaking to sedate them, load them in and, um, and yeah, tra even transport by truck is pretty significant. In the addition to, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry, you asked me about the cost. So for the Rhinos Without Borders, for the airlifting, one rhino was $45,000. Um, obviously, without the air transport, it's much, you know, it will be uh, much less costly when they can do this just by truck. But um, $45,000 for that project uh, to move those animals. They moved, they had a goal of 100 um, up until COVID uh, shut down the operation. They moved 87, so pretty close. Um, Parka funded the move of two of those. And then uh, those, but those animals have been very happy and healthy in their new home. And there are lots of babies. That's how do they, um, I'm assuming they get tracked once yes. they're translocated. How, who monitors them and how does mm -hmm. that, who funds the monitoring of them and who keeps track? Yeah. So the Rhinos Without Borders program um, still does all of the monitoring. And so our partnership is with Great Plains. So that is um, the uh, Joubert's uh, conservation um, organization, Great Plains Conservation. Uh, so that is the organization uh, that we support um, monetarily so they can support the funding of the monitors who are literally out in these fields every day uh, tracking these rhinos and making sure that they're safe. And so these are human monitors. I mean, they're not chipped or something. They're actually rangers or humans keeping All track. of the above. All of the above. So these particular rhinos have um, tracking uh, devices on their legs. Um, so they, the rangers can use satellite telemetry to locate where they are, but there are absolutely humans putting eyes on uh, the rhinos. Yes. That's, yep. that's incredible. And I'm, I can only imagine how brave of the people. On the well, and you know, we've, we've talked to a number of these folks, Jacqueline, um, both in Botswana, we had the honor to go on a walk with some rangers in Kenya once um, when they were out going to check camera traps. And, you know, they talk about not only are they sent out into the field for long periods of time on their deployment, if you will, um, but, you know, they're out there, but, you know, maybe they have a partner with them, but there's certainly not a whole lot of people around to socialize with. So it's very isolated and they don't ever know if they're going to come under fire directly, if they're going to find a poached animal. You know, they, we've had a number of conversations, too, with folks around it is incredibly traumatic for these monitors, for the vets, for the people who respond to these incidents to continually go out into the field and have to either try to save an animal who's still alive or do the postmortem on one of them who hasn't survived. It's incredibly traumatic for them. I I can I can't even imagine. That's yeah. That's, yeah. Yikes. Um 
can you tell us about how how the work that Parker is supporting and this translocation work in general supports um, you know, the communities and sort of the socioeconomic ecology of Botswana? I never had, I never in my wildest dreams when we started this um, realized what an impact this has on the people. So these, so, so there are so many jobs created, right? when you think about the safari industry. So it's not just your guide who's driving you in your truck or the camp staff who's taking care of you in the camp. It's the airlines, right? Not only internationally, but locally as you take the jumper plane or something like that, all of those jobs as well. Um, the conservation role, right? The monitors who have to oversee the safety of these um, animals, the vets who take care of them, all of the people involved in um, you know, if there's an animal who needs care and rehabilitation and re-release out to the wild. So, so many, many impacts from a job perspective. Um, but we, we've also learned about what these animals come to mean to communities for um, their pride, right? In what they have in their natural world and their participation in, the, in saving these species and and really contributing back in a way to nature um, and the ecology of these areas in which they live and um you know we had a friend uh who we met he was our guide in botswana we've uh invited him and he came to the us and he talked about when he went home after his trip here um, he sent me a letter that was just lovely and in that letter he said about how his family and his community really have have associated us and his friendships that he's built this opportunity for him to come to the US and travel to a place that he had dreamed about traveling and and they all associate it with the rhinos right because that's what brought us all together so even the for all of us these friendships that we've created and opportunities that we have to travel of course but you know, when we go, we tend to turn these trips into group trips. So we've, I think, it, I think we're up to three dozen people now who have gone um, just because of the work that we've done. And again, a couple of safari guides who we've had the opportunity to invite here and, and be um, able to host them and show them around the U.S. Is re so there are, there, I had no idea. Um, what the people impact was going to be, but it's real, and and we lo we just love that aspect of it. How how has tourism has obviously been very impacted by COVID in the last couple of years? How has the decrease in tourism, um, you know, affected that that whole uh, industry and devastating? Economy? Absolutely devastating. So um, everything shut down. Um, so the dollars just stopped and and tourism dollars fund a significant part of conservation. Right. So a lot of the money that you spend when you go on safari is funneled back into communities, whether it's from the companies who have an investment right in their community and they're putting money back in or whether you're doing a cultural experience, whatever the case may be, a lot of tourism money goes into conservation and it just stopped. So that meant that there were number one, less eyes on the ground for anything suspicious that was happening. There was no money flowing, um, jobs just stopped and people were sent home. Um, the one good thing that happened for some period of time was while there were lockdowns and people couldn't move, that also meant poachers couldn't move, right? So you stood out like a sore thumb if you were moving about when there was lockdown. So there was a brief period um, where poaching decreased to some extent. Um, but as soon as things started opening up and then, you know, the, the poverty issue is real, too. Right. We talk all the time about, you know, it. it you know, you hear that a poacher got caught or a poacher got killed or and, you know, I think people's immediate reaction is, you know, a little bit of cheering like one for the animals. But when you realize that that's a human life, someone's brother, someone's family member, um, you know, it's not really 
celebratory, right? And so these folks, you know, on the ground, they are doing this work too. I, I personally have come to believe that a lot of them are taken advantage of. They're not getting rich off of doing this, right? The folks getting rich are very far removed um, from these guys doing the poaching. And so again, you know, lockdowns happened, jobs that there were stopped, people became even more desperate. So then when things did start opening back up, we are, you know, seeing a surge post COVID, but COVID was really devastating um, from a tourism and dollar flow uh, perspective for conservation. I really appreciate you highlighting the the compassionate piece of their lives because I am absolutely guilty of reading articles about a poacher getting killed and thinking like, so am I. Oh, well. Um, but I like so many animal exploitation, you know, people doing uh, the harm, the direct harm are also being exploited. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's very true. And, and it does also highlight, you know, you, when you, when you, take a step back and say, you know, why, why would someone do that? You know, when you think about if you're hungry, you're hungry, right? And if someone's offering you a lot of money or whatever the case, you know, I think that it very often still circles back to money and poverty and those other ills um, that we need to think about. But I also think that's where it is very important for us to engage the local communities um, so that they understand that, it isn't just about the rhinos, right? Or the elephants or the lions. We are really concerned about the people that surround them as well. And, and we need their help. And they are they can be the most valuable um, boots on the ground that we have. Has, has um, as we maybe come out of COVID um, slowly, has tourism increased or, you know, um, come back? Yes. At the same rate as poaching has probably increased since lockdowns ended sort of probably for um, tourism resurged? You know, that's a great question, Jacqueline. And I haven't thought about it in that in that way. And so I don't have an honest answer for you. I do know uh, we when we were in South Africa last year, I can tell you we were in a big five. We stayed in a big four, I'm sorry, reserve. Um, that had a lot of capacity and we were literally the only people there. So they were thrilled, thrilled last year. And when we were out and about, I mean, there was, it was, listen, we got a little spoiled. It was a little nice because you were the only cars on the road. You know, there, when you were looking at the animals, there wasn't other cars converging or anything like that. So, um, Last year was a little bit better. I would have called it a trickle in from the tourism rebound and poaching probably I and again, I don't I haven't looked at it to tell you this in a in a data driven way, um, but it had started to tick back up probably faster than tourism was starting to rebound last year. This year, tourism has rebounded. I wouldn't say it's back. Um, but it's significantly better this year, very different when we were there this year, very different in talking to the folks there. And poaching is, is again, it's shifted, and I'm referring right now to the province that we were in very specifically, um, but very, very high right now. That's unfortunate on the poaching and great that, that tourism is, yeah. is making a comeback. Are there recent, or is there at least, you know, is there a 2021 count of rhinos remaining, uh, or, or remaining in the wild? So I guess. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Remaining in the wild. So black rhinos, um, roughly 5,400, um, white rhinos. So there's, um, two sub, there's two subspecies, Northern white rhinos, two females left in the world. That's it. Two females in Kenya under 24-7 guard. That's the end of the species, subspecies. And then southern white rhinos are probably, I would say, around 18 to 20,000 um, left in the wild. Um, and the latest poaching statistics that I've seen, um, they generally lag for a few years till full counts can come in. And Namibia, South Africa, Botswana, um, 
definitely have poaching. Um, Kenya is has seen a significant decrease, so doing much better there. Um, but the overall numbers for the last few years have been around five, a little less than 500. Um, but uh, this year we think it'll it'll end up being more. It's more in the first half of 22 than it was in the first half of 21. Hmm. That's sad. Yes. Um, can you tell us about Ribbon? Oh, Ribbon. So Ribbon is the orphan who we sponsor at Care for Wild Rhino Sanctuary in South Africa. Um, a few years ago, Ribbon was actually... Um, identified by tourists um, as a calf out there on her own, somewhat near a camp. Um, and they converged on her, watched her. There was no mom anywhere to be found. Um, so she, in fact, was an orphan. So she was uh, darted and brought to care for wild. Um, and she is now a big girl. She is out um, being uh and the soft release, if you will, learning how to live with her crash back out in the wild, a very protected area. Um, but she has done remarkably well. We got to visit her in 2019. She was so little, you had to bend over to give her a bottle. Um, but she is doing great. She's a big, big girl now on her way to being out in the wild. She has been dehorned. Um, and that will continue for her for the foreseeable future that uh, we have to do that, but she's doing great. Yay. Thank you. And the Parka for sponsoring her and supporting her. Thank you and all of our supporters who allow that. Um, speaking of ADP and your supporters, what's yeah. been most challenging in regard to the at-home logistics of starting a nonprofit? Oh my gosh. So what hasn't been most challenging? <laughs> I, yeah, I so I think honestly it has been um, really trying to understand, and this is where ADP has been. When I I don't underestimate, or I should I don't underemphasize how important it is for me to have felt like I have a partner who I can. I almost feel like you guys are on call because that's how responsive you've been. And I don't, ha thankfully, I haven't had major issues, but I feel like I have a partner who I can consult at any time. I'm not left wondering. And that was the biggest struggle for me is I did not realize the scope um, of starting a nonprofit and all of the, you know, the legalities and regulations that there are to be a really robust and compliant um, nonprofit. And so the consultations that I've been able to have with ADP, the mentorship that I've been connected with, um, seriously, for how to think about nonprofits and how to take us, you know, how to be very serious about ourselves and our work and really um, get ourselves out there in a very serious way. Small doesn't mean not serious, right? Um, but I think it's realizing the scope um, of everything that you have to consider. Thank you for those kind words. And I know that our legal team is going to listen in as well. And we'll appreciate that. It's yeah. definitely uh, the, pri the privilege and pleasure is ADPs to be able to Thank support you. your work and your, uh, your mission. Thank so, you. Thank you for letting us be a partner in that. We appreciate it deeply. What, what's the best way that people can support Parka in this work? The best way is uh, to visit our website, which is parkainc.org. Um, on that website, we have everything uh, ranging from our projects that we're supporting. Uh, we are very proud to say that we are a hundred percent volunteer um, board. We do, we have no salaries. We are potentially a little overly, you know, concerned about getting as much money as we can into the work being done in Africa, not on, you know, administrative costs, but the website is the best way. All of the donations uh, that people make are incredibly valuable, supporting our fundraisers if folks are in the Philadelphia area. Um, and I think really, I can't also underestimate um, sharing the story because if people don't know, they can't care. 
and when people know they do. And so really helping us to spread the word about the plight of the rhino, which again, to your early point, Jacqueline, helps in so many other ways, not just for other animals, but for people, um, that would be great. And I, I thoroughly recommend, we're gonna have a new website launch in the next few days. So even if you check it out soon, check it out again in a few days, it has all the information about our trips. And I highly encourage anyone um, to please join us. They are fantastic experiences and you will get to realize all of what you and I have tried to share with folks about how wonderful Africa is. That congratulations on your, your nice. new site launch. That's exciting. Yes. Um, I will also add in that when I was looking at your website, um, make sure not to miss whether it's on this website or the next one, the conservation chronicles on YouTube. Oh. Um, and Heather has also done a TEDx talk. Um, so there are some really great uh, audio visual Thanks. resources to share as well. Thanks. Um, Heather, if there's one thing that people could take away from today's interview, what would you hope that would be? I would hope that people take away that uh, rhinos are important um, for many reasons. And that, again, this work is, is very, very singularly focused on that animal. Um, but the impacts are so broad. The impacts are here. The impacts are in Africa. The impacts are to other animals and to people. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing your time today and your expertise, but also for the work that you are doing in addition to an already full, busy life like everybody. Um, it's so, so appreciated. And thank you for letting ADP share in that. I am honored to be here, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for this time and for all of the partnership from ADP. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we look forward to more collaboration going forward. Thank you. Thanks so much.